This is how the US dollar dies. Shocking details. Now, there's been lots of talk about the US dollar losing its status of the world's reserve currency and an entire global currency collapse. Many people want to know when this is going to happen, but few realize that we're actually in the middle of it right now. We're actually watching it happen, but most fail to realize because they don't understand the signs. They don't know what to watch for and how all this happens. So in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how this process unfolds and happens, what comparisons we can draw from history to today's death of the US dollar, and what people could have done to protect themselves before, and of course, what should be done right now to protect yourself in the future. So let's go. All right, now real quick, before we dig in, if you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos because I wanna change the way you think about money, because almost everything that you've learned is wrong. And if you can learn to change the way you think about money, then you can have more freedom and more options for your life, your family, and your future. Now, if you like these topics, help me out just one quick second and click on that like button so the algorithm sends it out to more people. Of course, if you're not already subscribed, hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so you're notified every time I put a new video out. Also, um, I'm taking questions that are asked on these videos and I'm answering them on my new channel, Market Disruptors. If you have any questions about the content on here, leave a question on the video and I'll make a video of it and I'll answer it on my new channel, Market Disruptors. It's linked in the description of this video. Now, if I pick your question to be answered in the new video, I'm gonna send you $25 in Bitcoin just for asking the question. So ask away, let's go ahead and have a discussion. I'd love to try to respond to as many of these as I can. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Today, we are talking about currencies collapsing, and more importantly, what is going to happen, what is actually happening right now, what's going to happen, how it's gonna work, what could have been done to prevent the destruction and damage to people before, and what you can do as well, right? But first thing we have to understand why currencies even die in the first place. We have to understand the problem so we can understand how this works. So, you know, we'll start with why. Why do currencies die? Well, the first thing is that all currencies, and we can say this conclusively, all, all currencies either devalue or die or both, all right? When that happens, cash and bonds are completely wiped out. And so a lot of people wanna know what's gonna happen? What, will I be okay holding stocks? Will I be okay holding bonds, et cetera? And when the currencies die, we know from history that cash, which of course is the currency, it's an, it's an IOU, right? It's a claim. Um, the cash and of course the bonds, they all get wiped out. That's what happens. It's not good. Um, the other thing that we know is that this is done in order to reduce or wipe out debt. So what happens is a country racks up way too much debt. And in order to try to pay back that debt, they will either usually try to reduce it by inflating the currency or wiping it out altogether. And of course, printing and devaluing the currency is the easiest way to do that. Now, if we take a look at this, this is uh, from Ray Dalio, one of his books, uh, Principles for Navigating the Big Debt Crisis. And he talks about that uh, there's basically four levers that policy makers have when they rack up too much debt, when they have way too much debt and the debt service levels are too high. There's not enough cash flow. So they have four options. And here's what the options are. One is austerity. So that basically means the government chooses to spend less money. How novel of an idea, right? Um, so that would be option number one. They've racked up too much debt. They don't have enough income. So option number one to get out of that is to cut back on spending. That's of course what you and I would do if we had a problem. The second option would be a debt default and a restructuring. Of course, we do have bankruptcy laws. If you get in too much debt that you can't pay back, of course you can do bankruptcy. So the government has that option. The third option that you would have, that a country would have, would be to transfer money and credit from those who have more than they need to have less than they need. That's transfer wealth, redistribution, of course, raise taxes. That's what he's talking about here. So by raising taxes, we transfer from the rich and we give to the poor. And then finally, the fourth option, number four right here, printing money and devaluing it. And so now that you understand the four options, it's pretty easy to see which ones the governments are going to choose over and over again. Now, throughout history, like I said, conclusively, we can say this, that all currencies are devalued. Since the 1700s, we've seen 750 different currencies. It's an amazing number, 750 different currencies. 
and all of them have been wiped out except for 20%. 20% have remained, but of the 20% that have remained, they've all been devalued. Now, when I say devalued, it means they buy less than they did originally. All right, now there's um, lots of different currencies today than there were, obviously, because they're always changing. And so, you know, Germany used to have a different currency, Japan, Spain, China, all these countries used to have different currencies at one point. And so while people think, you know, oh, it's always been the US dollar since I've been born or whatever country you happen to be in, they changed a long time. So sometimes you have to zoom out and that's what I'm trying to do, give you some of that perspective. Now, what you wanna understand is like I said, the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world right now. However, the reserve status, it doesn't last. It's never lasted throughout history and there's no reason to think that it's ever going to change. When I went back to the four reasons why a country um, or the four options a country has when they get too much debt, of course, if you look at the United States, you realize we have too much debt. But we can see here that the average lifespan of a currency is about 100 years. You can see right here, we had Portugal, Spain, Netherlands, France, the UK, and of course, here we are with the United States right now having that reserve currency status of the world. Um, but like I said, they're about 100 years, and as you might be able to guess, we're at about that 100 year mark today. Now, I'm not gonna go all the way back through history. I mean, I kind of showed you a rough overview of how those currencies have changed. However, we'll look at just the last one to get a little bit of frame of reference here. And so if we're looking back um, at this transition where it went from the British pound sterling to the US dollar, we really go back to look at like World War I. And World War I is really when that shift started to happen. Now, it wasn't an overnight thing. It actually was about a 30 year process, um, which we can take a look at right here. So in 1914, what happened is in order to fight World War I, um, the governments of the world had to abandon the gold standard. The gold standard was too restrictive. They needed more money. So they got rid of the gold standard and they printed a bunch of fake fiat money. Of course, they did that in order to go fight the war. The US wasn't in the war at the time, so the US started loaning money to all the countries that were fighting. What a, what a good position to be in, right? Make all the money from the war and not be involved in it. In 1919, like I said, Britain left the gold standard. Um, they abandoned it as well. And then the US, through this process, was able to amass all the gold. What does that mean? So um, as these countries needed money, they needed um, you know, weapons and munitions and things like that, um, the US supplied them with all the stuff to go fight the wars and in exchange for their gold. So the US required gold as payment. And so during that time, the US amassed the gold through World War II. As a matter of fact, by the end of World War II, the US held about two thirds of the entire world's gold, which then led to 1944, because the United States had two thirds of the world's gold. It was the superpower of the world at the time. The Bretton Woods Agreement was formed, which is pictured here. We've talked about this extensively on the channel. The Bretton Woods Agreement is when the entire world or the financial world got together and basically agreed to have a one world currency system that was all backed on gold. The dollar would be backed by gold, and then all the currencies would be backed to the dollar, all right? Now, we are, like I said, people ask all the time, when, when is this gonna happen? When is the US dollar going to lose its status? When are the currencies gonna collapse? When is the currency reset? And I'd say, well, you're watching it, it's happening. We're literally watching this happen now, as I showed you on the last slide, it was a, about a 30 year process and we're in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, we are watching it right now unfold. And so, like I said, it's not when, it's now, it's happening right now. So let me show you a couple things that are happening so you can see this. So first the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which is kind of um, the central bank above all central banks, if you will, they were created during the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. Um, they've stated that the US dollar is in, uh, in decline. As a matter of fact, we can see that the dollar used to be the dominant currency at about a 64% of all the transactions in 2017, and now it only has about a 59%. So it's losing its status. Um, part of this is, as you might already guess, been driven by, of course, this, <laughs> the, big, the big pandemic. And we can see that it's um, because of the money printing, because of what's going on, because of what's going on globally, could the dollar lose its global status? So we've seen that. Um, of course, there's news headlines, no shortage of these news headlines about the coming crash in the dollar will unfold. Of course, we see that all the time. Um, per the IMF, like I said, they've, they've told us that the dollar is losing its status. And we can see right here, here's a good illustration of it. And so, you know, here's the US dollar share, which of course is still more than half. But what we can see illustrated in this chart is that it's losing its status. And then of course, when we look at the US dollar, 
as a basket. This is the strength of the US dollar. It's known as the Dixie, the dollar index. And we can see that it's been continuing to lose, lose, lose. Now it did bottom out right here um, and it slowly started to rebound a little bit but it's still way down from where it was. So the dollar is going down. The news headlines are projecting it. The pandemic is only speeding this up, but that is only telling you part of the picture. All right, now it's only telling you part of the picture because you're looking at all the wrong metrics. You know, when you look at the dollar index, the DXY, it's measuring the dollar against other currencies but the other currencies are fiat currencies. So what good does it do, right? You want to compare, right? So you're comparing prices to fiat. Well, let's compare one fiat currency to another fiat currency. But what we really want to do is we need to retrain our minds. We have to rethink about things. And instead of looking at the dollar, we need to think about the purchasing power. How much goods and services, wealth is not currency. Wealth is real assets. Wealth is goods and services. So how much, what's the purchasing power? How much goods and services can I get for the currency? That's how we have to want to look. We have to look at that. And so we need to look at it compared to other things. So let's take a look at that. So here is gold priced in dollars. So instead of comparing the dollar to the euro, the yen, the yuan, whatever, let's look at the dollar compared to gold. So we can see here that it was 20 bucks an ounce. 1933, it went to 35 bucks an ounce. See, the dollar and gold maintained its purchasing power. 1971, everything went haywire. And now, look, so this is gold in prices. So now does the dollar look like it's holding its purchasing power or does it look like it's going down? Well, let's take a look at a couple other measures here. Again, the dollar compared to what? This is the Case-Shiller U.S. national home prices. So the dollar here, home prices are going up. Are you starting to get the picture? Most people think that gold was a great investment. Real estate was a great investment. The reality is neither one of them that were that good of an investment. It just takes more dollars to buy those things. Let me show you a couple more examples. We can take a look at oil. Oil is also wealth. It's goods, it's services, right? And we can see that it's held strong ever since. And then we can see how much it's come up as, as well. Was, was oil a good investment? or did it just maintain its purchasing power? Of course, uh, you might have seen this chart. It's one of my favorites. This is the price of Bitcoin, which has stayed relatively smooth and now it's gone up. So is Bitcoin going up in value or is the dollar coming down? And so what you wanna do is you wanna to start to compare um, relative prices. Like I said, comparing different prices. So what is the house priced in? gold? What is the house priced in oil? What is the house priced in Bitcoin? Um, and so you can get a different view because if you're always looking at things priced in dollars, or other fiat currencies, you don't understand what's really going on. Here's gold versus stock prices. Of course, you can see stocks and gold both going up. Again, these are all in US dollars. Now, I wanna bring this book up for a minute. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later in the end, but there's this book, When Money Dies. And it's a cool book. Um, I'm gonna get into some facts about this book. But one interesting point in this book, this is about Germany, which we'll get back to. Uh, but they said that as prices were going high, everyone thought they were going rich. And so they were selling all their assets for those sky high valuations. They were banking the money, the dollars, the fiat currency. At the end, they wish they would have held on to the assets. We're going to talk about that. So let's get a little bit of historical perspective. I want to show you how this unwound in the past. And when you see how it unwound in the past, you're going to see very clearly of how this will probably unfold in the future. And then of course, exactly what we need to be doing right now to protect ourselves. If we had a time machine, if they could have gone back in time and got a redo, but they can't, but we have the option. So let's go back and look at the Weimar Republic. So this is one that I haven't really dug into on this channel. So you probably haven't seen, at least not here. And so this is a very good example, a historical reference to show us what could happen. So we can look at 1922, Germany defaulted on their debt. So if we go back in time, rewind the clock a little bit here, of course we had World War I, um, Germany lost the war. They were ordered to pay reparations. Um, they had to pay for the costs of the war. Well, what happened is, they defaulted on that and they couldn't end up making their payments. So France and Belgium said, well, we're gonna go invade um, Germany and we're just gonna take the stuff. So we're gonna go to their factories, we're gonna go into their industrial section and we're gonna take all that stuff to get the money that they owe us. What happened is the German government ordered all the workers there. This is a key piece, pay attention. The German government ordered the workers to not work. Right? France and Belgium went in and took over all the industrial centers and the German government ordered the people not to work and they told them to have passive resistance. All right, so to, in order to not pay the employees to work, 
and they couldn't already repay their debts, what did they do? Well, they printed money. Sound familiar? Didn't have the money for the debts, didn't have any more money. They needed to pay people not to work, and so they printed lots of money. And let's take a look at what the effects of this printing money are. I think when you look at it like this, you're gonna see how dramatic this is. Of course, we're calling this the death spiral. All right, I've talked about the debt debt spiral. We're talking about the death spiral that they went into, uh, as you can see from this picture here. So just look at this illustration to really see what this is about. So in 1914, before World War II, bread in Germany was 13 cents. Two years later, it had gone to 19 cents. Not too bad. Um, three years later from that, it was at 26 cents. So it had doubled right here in five years. Now, um, I didn't look it up, but I would encourage you to go look at the price of bread increases and not just how much the price of bread has increased, but look at the size of the bread and the shrinkflation that we're seeing there as well. Interesting note. Okay. So a year later it went from 26 cents to a dollar 20. So things didn't seem so bad here. And then here and here's kind of like that, that, that frog in the boiling pot of water five years later, 120 to 350, two years later, 350 to seven hundred dollars this is where things start coming off the rails seven hundred dollars um, in the spring of next year it went to twelve hundred dollars that was spring by september it was at two million dollars for a loaf of bread it went to 670 million by october and the next month december three billion and then if you can believe it a hundred billion dollars for a loaf of bread things went off the rails now <clears throat> You had $100 billion, you thought you were rich. However, that $100 billion would only buy you a loaf of bread. Now, how does that even make any sense? How could you spend $100 billion for a loaf of bread? Now, remember, this is before Venmo. This is before debit cards. They didn't have that. They had to use cash. And you can see pictures of people with actual cash going down. This is uh, transporting pay salaries. So in order to get paid, they didn't have direct deposit back then. They literally would give you a wheelbarrow full of a pallet of cash like this. That was your paycheck. And a side note on this is that because it was going up so fast, inflation was so fast, you had to be paid multiple times a day. So you'd get paid in the morning, you'd go out and buy whatever goods you needed right then. You'd come back, work for a couple hours, get paid at lunch, go out, buy some more supplies. Come back, work for a few more hours, get paid and go back out because the prices of things were going up so fast. And this is what your paycheck looked like. And as a matter of fact, things got so bad that eventually people resorted to putting cash into their furnaces for heat. The reason why is because wood was more valuable than the cash, if you can believe it. Now, um, this is kind of an illustration that shows you just how far and fast this went. Um, so this is the CPI. We talk about CPI a lot on this channel. It's the Consumer Price Index. It's what the government uses to monitor inflation, the cost of consumer goods. And you can see this is, uh, we started 1914. This is what we started here on this chart. On this chart. And then of course we went all the way up to uh, here, and so you can see it, it seemed like prices were going pretty slow. And then you can see right here, they kind of they kind of took off. That's right about here when bread went from 13 cents to, to, to a 350. So it kind of started taking off, but then it just gets out of control and it can't be controlled any longer. All right, now, if we compare then to now, right, we're using history to give us a guide of where we're at now and where that could potentially be going in the future. So if we're comparing this to now, um, they printed lots of money to pay debts they couldn't afford and to pay people not to work. And let's take a look and see what we're doing in the United States with our money supply. So we have the M1 and the M2 money supply. Now I've pulled these charts up before. This is the M1 money stock. Now notice this says discontinued. They decided they didn't want to update this chart anymore. They don't want us to see this. But if we compare this, actually, let me put this, uh, here, well, it was on the other screen, sorry. Uh, if we compare this, this sort of looks kind of similar to what we saw in Germany. And see how things are starting to take off right here? And then look at that. That is where we are with the M1 money supply. We can also take a look at it in regards to the M2 money supply. Kind of same thing, it's going up at a little bit of a faster pace here, and then it just took off like crazy. All right, now, in addition, 
In addition to printing money like crazy, another parallel to draw from, um, from Germany is that they couldn't afford to pay their debts. Well, the United States can't even afford to pay their debts and they can't even afford to pay for their programs. As a matter of fact, that's why this says the US budget deficit hit a record of 1.7 trillion for the first half, the first half of the fiscal year. So that means the deficit, they're spending more than they're bringing in. So that's like you living off credit cards, right? Your job doesn't give you enough money um, to pay for your rent and your, your food, et cetera. So you're living off credit cards, you're in a deficit. So we're in a deficit of $1.7 trillion in the first half of this year. To see this in a little bit of a chart, so it kind of makes sense, I mean, just look at that growth. And so when we're looking at history as our guide, it starts to bring a lot of clarity to where we're at today. Now, one more parallel to draw from Germany. If you remember back to the story, Germany couldn't repay their debts. So they were invaded to take over their in industries to get the money that, they, that was owed to them. Germany asked the people to do a passive resistance, which was not work. And if you don't work, we're going to pay you. All right, well, look at this. We need to pay people to stay home, pay people not to work. Now, of course, you hear all the talk about UBI um, and all these other types of programs to actually pay people not to work. And of course, if history is our guide, we know exactly where that's going. Now, I just wanna let you know a little bit of perspective here, all right? So like I said, a lot of people are asking, when is this going to happen? And like I said, it is happening. It's happening right now. I'm showing you in, in, in Germany, they didn't notice bread going up that much in the beginning, but the signs, or the, I should say the catalyst that caused that to happen were put in place previous. Just like the cause for the dollar's demise has been put in place. And it's also creeping up, but we want a little bit of zoomed out perspective here. And so what we can do is we can look at the price of gold from 1915 to 1935. And the reason why we want to look at the price of gold is because when you only compare fiat currency to other fiat currencies, you don't have a good measure. So if we look at the price of gold uh, from this period, 1915 to 1935, you can see gold priced in, in marks, in German marks, Here's around 1915, and then you can look at how this took off. Now, the reason why I wanna show you this chart is because I want you to get perspective on how this works, all right? This was the trade of the decade right here, right? If you would have bought here and held here, you would have done amazing. Now, on this channel, you've heard me talk about consistently that I believe that gold and Bitcoin and even some commodities will be the trade of the decade because of the money printing. But what happens is it shot up and then it went down. And people are like, oh my gosh, we're losing money. I, I, I can't afford to lose money, I'm out. They didn't have patience. And then it went up and then it went back down. And then it went up and it went up really high. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, we're rich. And then it went back down again. Oh my gosh, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Because they didn't believe in the thesis, right? They didn't understand what they were doing. They didn't understand the reason why these things were doing what they were doing, which was couldn't afford their debts, massive money printing, paying people not to work. And they didn't understand what the effects of those were. Then it shoots up like crazy. Everybody piles back in right here on the top and then it drops. I'm out, I'm out, I can't take it anymore. And then it shoots up again. So the point is that we need to have this perspective. Let me show you another chart here. This is, um, this is the value of the paper mark to the gold mark. And this kind of shows you the same thing. Uh, when you look at it here, you're like, oh my gosh, if I could have just bought, how many times have I heard this? Or you've probably heard this. If you could have just gone back in time and bought Bitcoin, or you could have gone back in time and bought Amazon, et cetera. Well, you probably wouldn't have gotten rich because of this, right? You bought here and you sold here. Oh my gosh, you were the smartest person in the world. The problem is you bought, you held, you held, you held, and you probably cashed out thinking that was the best deal ever, or then it dropped and you're like, oh my gosh, I lost all my money. I can't believe it, I'm out. And then it goes up and then it comes down and then it goes up and it comes down and then it goes way up and then it comes down. And you didn't understand, you got shaken up because of the volatility because you didn't understand what was going on, all right? As I like to say, nothing goes up in a straight line. Nothing goes down in a straight line either. Now, um, one thing, I'll go back to this book one more time. It's a great book. You probably wanna go read it um, because it's when the money dies. But uh, again, they said that uh, the perspective was that people were selling their assets for astronomical values. Oh my gosh, Bitcoin's at a new all-time high. I'm cashing out, I'm going back to dollars. Oh my gosh, my real estate state has never been higher, I'm cashing out, I'm going to dollars. My stocks are at all time highs, I'm cashing out, I'm going to dollars. And that's what they were doing, read the book. They thought they were getting rich selling their assets for sky high valuations, and at the end of the day, they owned no assets and all they owned was a bunch of worthless paper, all right? So the advice for you, 
find inflation hedges, buy assets that can go up with the rate of inflation. You don't wanna be holding cash, all right? And the other thing is to take control now. Like I said, this is happening now. It's not about timing it like, hey, I'm gonna wait till it happens. It's happening. The catalyst is there. <laughs> The debts can't be paid. People are being paid not to work. They're printing money at a rate that we've never seen before, and the price of bread is going up. So take control now, move to assets, of course, gold, of course, Bitcoin, um, maybe real estate, um, et cetera. Do not be cashing out thinking you're getting rich at this time. Now, let me know what you think. Do you agree with this or am I, <laughs> have I lost my mind? Let me know in the comments down below. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't like the video, give me a thumbs down, that's okay. Either way, I wanna hear from you, so leave me a comment and ask me a question. I want your questions because I love to engage in that thought process. If I, ask, if I answer your question um, on my other channel, I'm gonna send you $25 in Bitcoin. Also, if you like these shirts, I'm selling them linked in the, buy, uh, in the description. There's a couple other um, designs that we have if you wanna support sound money. All right, that's what I got for you today. To your success, I'm out.